Gallifrey stands. That's right. The Dr. Squeeze show is just going to take a wee break while we break down all the season one episodes of the third epoch of Doctor Who, kicking things off with Shooty Gatwa uh, going into his main run as the Doctor. I am so excited and I wanted to bring some buddies on to talk to me about it. So this week, joining me uh, from the High Council of Geeks, which you will find on Facebook, it's Jack Taylor and from also from the High Council of Geeks, as well as uh, my buddy from the Retrek podcast, which you can find on YouTube, Facebook, and all other places where you get your podcasts. It's Captain Jim. Gents, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Doing well, mate. And it's Captain Jim King, of course. I don't know why your surname suddenly went out of my brain, but I looked at the thing and said, Captain Jim, brain freeze! Uh, so... We're going to break down the first two episodes. We got a double drop this time, and the first time ever that Doctor Who was piloted on uh, iPlayer. We actually have the ratings, which were released um, in the last couple of days, and it's showing us two million because it only reports the TV viewing. But it's thought on this occasion, especially, it's going to be a bigger bump from the uh, from the iPlayer and. The amount, it was, I think it was something like 2.2 2 something or other, which just beat the Sea Devils episode uh, of the Jodie Whisk era, which was apparently the kind of lowest rating up until now. However, like, oh, you know, this was one above that. But again, it's thought that we're going to get a, a big difference from the, so uh, it, from the ratings. It, it got 2 million live then, despite point it whatever. dropping yeah. on. That, yeah, exactly. I don't think that's too bad, really. No, I was... <laughs> I was curious how that was going to impact it. And I'm interested to get your take on this one. Uh, well, both of you, because to me, Doctor Who is one of the only things that still feels like appointment viewing. And the idea of a family sitting around on a Saturday night to watch Doctor Who all at the same time. And uh, to me, it just feels a bit of a shame that something's kind of been lost there and uh, Russell T Davis I think talked about that idea and wanting to get it back on Saturdays and yeah I don't know it feels like maybe there's an external pressure into doing this um it, I don't know it just yeah. feels like it's lost something by doing it this way yeah I mean my, my television side of it's gone Mm. Yeah, that was my initial thoughts. I mean, I think this is obviously a concession to the state. So if it dro it's it's dropping worldwide mm. at our version of midnight. So where it drops at midnight here, the Americans get it at a time where it's kind of viewable during the day for them. So we get the excitement of it being just on the dot of the kind of new day, but they kind of get the uh, a friendly time for them. So I, I, yeah, obviously I think that's playing into it. And RTD still sort of to a degree gets to have his cake and eat it too by having it going out on tea time on a Saturday. But yeah, I mean, I did have the same feelings, but I've got to admit for the kind of like for the concessions, like for instance, you know, there's an early scene, which I was going to mention here in a minute on space babies, where the place where they go to in prehistoric earth is in America, which seems like there's just little kind of things, yeah. which I think are sneaking yeah. in, which are nods to America, which I think for the degree we're getting, the only one which I really objected to was on the Christmas special. I don't know why, but it really pissed me off that they put the date backwards. It's like, that's sacrosanct. You know, that should be the Is only one. Oh, I really know. Right at the beginning, it's like December December 23rd, and then the year, which is in the American format. 
So it was not in numbers because otherwise that really would confuse. But they put the month, day, then the year. I don't oh, know why. Uh, I've yeah, seen that I used can... on a lot of British stuff now, though. They seem to be oh, Anglo-Americanizing everything. Yeah, I so. thought you yeah. meant twelve twenty-three. Like if they'd done no, it no, that no, way, no, no. oh, well, that that no, that would be a riot. Right? <laughs> yeah, that yeah, that'd be a deal be... breaker. But I don't know. It just Daleks are gone. Good. For some reason i don't know why but that was just like oh, oh that just had my ocd just ticking over just having it in the wrong order but anyway that's i didn't that. notice that see i'm wondering as well if we've yeah. lost quite a bit due to the perceived eurovision boycott as well because uh, how many people be. rather than just turning off the tv you know went out or you know when did something else it's like i'm not watching eurovision so tv's off for three hours gone away and it's like Maybe, Maybe. Live, live and stuff on the, the other side time. of that, those who are watching Eurovision probably having a little party around it. Maybe didn't have the TV on before. Yeah. So, you know, they they did think that might have an impact one way or the other. Um, yeah, next week might be the one to actually gauge where this is going. Then, yeah, because uh, we'll see what what the overnights are for that, and we'll also at the same time get the uh, consolidated figures mm. for this. I, I really think the overnight figures really mean very little these days it really is the consolidate which they do it's it's more just the idea of it being a a community thing and everyone watching it oh, at the yeah. same time that is a bit of a shame so that that was the one thing you could rely on that particularly in you know the the sort of circles that that we move in that just about everybody i know is going to watch doctor who when it goes out live and i know that come half past seven eight o'clock on a saturday night i can talk to people about it whereas yeah. it, it's that thing with streaming where it's oh have you seen it where are you up to oh, i'm not sure yeah and by the time everybody's synced up you've forgotten what you wanted to say about it in the first place yeah. and it's just a bit of a shame that doctor who might lose a bit of that but i, but agree, you never but know. Always, I think there's always that thing as well where it's like that sucks for us because we've grown up with it that way but it's one of those things it's like you know uh getting nostalgic for vinyl i mean i mean that's a bad example because it's gone around okay for for tapes we love tapes when we were growing up that's what we had it's a format which i kind of miss because it feels so comfortable and nostalgic it just doesn't mean the thing to the kid like you know this is the way it's going to go again i agree with you from my heart but i i, I, I do a... appreciate what rtd is doing is making Doctor Who, he's trying to make it future-proof. He's been very kind of clear about that. That's why he wants to do the deal with uh, Disney because he feels like the BBC is going to go away at some point. Uh, you know, it's just inevitable with the forces kind of against it. So it's like, I appreciate he's playing the wrong game with Doctor Who, which is kind of nice. And the, there is a precedent as well. Like, I, I, I don't know why I was reading this, but I was reading about the Archers, you know, the radio soap. And um, apparently, like, the Archers, they do an omnibus of it, and they also do live episodes, and they also drop them all at midnight. And so there's about four different ways you can listen to the Archers. And apparently the online community has sort of galvanized, and they've worked out hashtags for each particular different way. So basically, you can still go online believe it or not you can go online and not get archers spoilers as long as you know which hashtags to use and i don't know i could see something like that happening with doctor who like you know for the yeah. for the midnight viewers there'll be one particular way and chat you know not chat rooms but you know servers and discords and twitter feeds and everything and there'll be that for the midnight people then there'll be one for the live people i don't know yeah, um, yeah, you could play the secret Discord. Um, but yeah, I've forgotten what I was going to say. But yeah, um, let's get into the episodes proper, though, because uh, we've got two episodes to break down right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, first of all, I'm going to say, I think these should have gone in the other order. I think the Devil's Chord for a season opener yeah. would have been bigger, more dramatic. I agree. Space Babies, Babies I really enjoyed, but it just doesn't see, feel like a season opener to me. It, yeah, it's one of them, whenever they drop two at once of anything, I always think, is that because episode one's not quite up to snuff? And yeah, I feel like The Devil's Cod felt like 
a bit more weight to it, a bit more whammy mm. to it. It felt like it was more getting into the story. There was a much better sort of central conflict in it. And I, I think it worked as two episodes together. But yeah, I think if it had just been Space Babies and that had been your first introduction to this new iteration, yeah, maybe it wouldn't have quite had the impact. And it makes me wonder if somebody realised that and thought, Let, let's drop both of them at once. Because, what is there's eight episodes? So, yeah. this series... Yeah. So, we've done a quarter of the series in one fell swoop. And you think with it being such a big property, they'd want to, you know, eke it out as long as they can do. So, yeah, it does make me wonder but i agree yeah the other way around would uh it would have felt more yeah. impactful i think also, I think it's very it also raised a bit of an issue sorry it's good. no no no, it's, no it's you saying, it raised raised a little bit of an issue as well having the two together <clears throat> yeah you had one that was stronger and one that were a bit weaker but i think it raised a few inconsistencies that you noticed Ooh. by having them next to each other specifically yeah, I, yeah. The, doc the doctor never runs away Yes, I know it's that. Yeah, yeah I've episode gone one. Away. I don't run away. I've run away. Episode two. Yes. I've run away again. The doctor never yeah. runs away. It's like, well, how do you know? The last time you, yeah, yeah, yeah. he yeah. ran away. He says to him, "You know, ne you yeah. never run away." Like, well, he did five minutes ago, and yeah. you've only known him two minutes. Ah, uh, one thing I will add to this. I mean, because I thought exactly the same. And I I agree. It's still like e this doesn't kind of fully excuse it. But in the dialogue, when he talks about taking Ruby to back to Earth, and they show the kind of mm -hmm. wasteland Earth, she get, he goes, "Oh, when when is it? Like in your time? What uh, February? Like uh, sorry, um, June or July?" She says. So it is six months afterwards. So they have in right. their time had six months traveling, but. In terms of narrative, that's why I think maybe they originally did have these in a different order or like something different happened and they played about with it. Mm. But it seems like that line is to excuse exactly what you're saying. But it's like, yeah, but we as the audience have just seen the other episode. And even if it was a week apart, I think it is still, yes. I thought exactly the same. Why have the Doctor running way two episodes in a row? And it's fine to have that, but you need to really space that out if you want the Doctor to be the brave Doctor that we're kind of like portraying him as, as we want and to be. Like I noticed a few times Ruby had say something that gave the impression that she knew the Doctor a lot better than we've seen her get to know him. And maybe this thing about the six months, because you're right, I did I did notice this she said he said something like, Oh, it's June. And I was like, Oh, maybe originally you were gonna wear this in June, but they've brought it forward because that just seemed a bit um, but yeah. anyway, you it's know, June 2024. No, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I think I think they've, they've yeah. played about it. So it'd be interesting yeah. to see if they mention any other months where she's from, like, probably not because that's yeah, you only mention it if you've well, got it. But yeah, the so, fact it was a Christmas episode, then it was June. I'm going, okay, that, that happened fast. But the, the way the two episodes were constructed, you don't get the impression that they've been off traveling in between episodes. It, mm. it very much felt like one led straight into the other. But she'd say things like, like you say there with, or oh, you don't run away, or I think she says something like, you always have the answers. So, you know, something along those yeah. lines. You're like, yeah. well, well, I know he always has the answers because I've watched 60 years worth of his adventures. But she doesn't know that yet. She's only had three adventures with him. You know, it, it just seemed a little bit, almost a bit, sort of like the the sort of playing to two crowds. Like you've got to get the new fans in, and you've got to have this dialogue that establishes for people this is who the Doctor is. These are the the these are things we know about the Doctor. But if you're going to do that through a new character, you need to earn what that new character is saying. Um, but having said that, I thought the dialogue at the start of the first episode, Space Babies, was very well done in terms of dropping all the exposition and making it feel not like we were just being preached at in terms of this is the format of the show. Like It felt quite natural how the Doctor was saying, you know, I'm the Doctor, I'm from this planet. Um, this is the TARDIS, this is what it does. Uh, I thought that was actually pretty well done. 
Well, you'd be amazed to hear I actually took some notes this time. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I didn't have to, I didn't have you to fall back on, which I usually do. But uh, but just very quickly on the note before, like, yeah, it was um because the one thing it made me think of, I, I feel the same time sometimes with um Strange New Worlds with their version of Spock, because they've gone for a more human, emotionally vulnerable version of Spock, that's all good and well. But they keep referring to him as if he's the Spock we know which we know mm. he will become the super logical person. Yeah. But they've even going, oh, you showed emotion, Spock. That's such a surprise. What, like he does every week in that show. Like, you know, it's, you can't, it's the same thing. It's sort of having your cake and eating. Either they've just met or they've known each other. You can't mm. really, but, you know, you can't rely on the audience's knowledge for the character to know stuff. Yeah, so I, I do agree with that point. But yes, anyway, when we get into the episode, um, Ruby steps in the so we're straight where we left off from Christmas, which... Like as we're saying, makes the kind of thing about uh, it being suddenly uh, June later on very kind of striking in the next episode. Um, I do love that we get straight away, we get like this is very much to what you were saying there, Jim. Uh, the dogs is very full of energy. I love the fact that with every line that the shooter gets, <clears throat> is just bubbling with kind of just like, yeah, and he's just like so full of life. Uh, and you get the last of the Time Lords bit. And it was just when he goes, like, it really kind of, like, just went through. But he goes, they're gone! They're gone. Like, it was just so kind of, that cut through me. I don't know if that kind of played for you guys the same way. I I thought it was kind of, it almost him checking himself, like, it's, I've got this new exuberant personality, like, they're gone. Yeah. But then it sort of hits him and he's, He's yeah. like, oh, actually, that that's that's pretty serious. The the yeah. gun, you know. I'm I'm being too energetic almost about the fact that they're gone. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, I think it just no, stabbed gone. him, and it's like he was in this big high energy, <clears throat> and that came out in that mania almost. It's like, and it's like, oh fuck, I just said it. You know, I've just kind of had this conversation, and I do like the the fact that they're not doing the thing of like because it's fine. They did it with David Tennant that he didn't really want to talk about and stuff. This doctor's just he's an open heart or double open-hearted uh, doctor which i think kind of really suits him very well so um yeah i think does that we are sorry, running, sorry we're running a little bit of a like i know we're now the th the third era of doctor who aren't we what, yeah what does he call it the third epoch or whatever it is oh that was just what i said <laughs> yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know if that's been well, it's very much... i like it though we'll copyright that yeah yeah, yeah the third epoch but it's almost like we're back in 2006 again Mm. I know it's we've got, RTD, we've got a new 2005. Sorry, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. No, well, Jack was job, talking yeah. about when David Tennant came in. Oh, it. yeah, so really yeah. yeah, excellently. I, I admire that kind of uh, correction. Yeah, it's like we've gone, we've gone very full circle. But like you say, it is nice that he's not trying to play the same cards close to his chest. Doctor. Yeah, it's like we are back where we were nearly 20 years ago but we're not gonna we're not gonna stifle you know the, the audience's expectation we know the audience has seen this one so we're not gonna play you know mystery box for the new companion because mm. what's the point you know there's no jj abrams about it now because there was already a few scenes which did seem too reminiscent for me to rtd's yeah. previous work which like it, yeah. There was enough where it's like, okay, that could have been done, played a bit differently. Like you know, um, so I I appreciate when they did do something a bit different with it and kind of change around. Like the bit where the view screen opened, I thought it was just that is just basically um, the end of the world uh, with Rose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just right down the saying of it. Um, but before we go that, yeah, we do go back to prehistoric Earth in uh, America, and uh, I did. I thought it was a nice sweet moment with the kind of stepping on the butterfly and everything, and then Doctor kind of revives it. But two things with that. One is they put the whole clip, like the, the, the reveal was already in the trailer and then mm -hmm. they put the whole clip online, which is like, that is the, that's basically the whole scene is that. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. it kind of gave away. And the second point is, because we've established now, the doctor is the reason why regeneration exists. So all the time lords got all the regeneration energy from him. So presumably what happened with Matt Smith when he got his new regeneration cycle meant nothing because he already had that, but the time lords were trying to cover it up. Fine. Yeah. But does that mean he can just revive anything at any time now? Because it feels like there's no I like I'm... if there's been superpower like this, I like there to be something which limits it. Like 
Superman's got kryptonite, you know, that kind of thing. You've got to have something which stops him using that every time. Sorry, Jim. My head canon is that because he's recently regenerated, he still had a bit of regeneration energy and he breathed that on the butterfly. That but they could have put the awful. special effect in if that's what they were going for. That that would have worked. And I think David Tennant said like he had 45 hours after. So may, I guess if it's no, or could like two hours if it's the next day after, yeah, I suppose that could work. But it's, I hope so. I just don't like the idea that it's he like. He doesn't say it's that. He just blows easy. on the butterfly and it comes back to life. It, yeah. yeah it feels not... a little bit. Yeah. I know what you mean. It's, it's David like, Tennant could be a bit like Tennant or... rubbing his face after coming out of the chamber. Oh, God. Yeah. Don't even start me on that. When, yeah. when he, he fell through the ceiling and just that didn't trigger the regeneration. Mm. Yeah. Just fell from the sky. No regeneration. Uh, but like they, they have had a scene like to that point with David Tennant where he did um, he breathed some life into a TARDIS part to, or was it Christopher Eccleston? But anyway, to get the TARDIS going again when it was out of power, yeah. which is fine. And he goes, oh, that just cost me five years of my life or something like that, which works when the Doctor is an immortal being from another universe who has unlimited regenerations, which he. You see, I always saw it as they've found a way to cap his regenerations. Same as they did the rest of the population. Could have been, like, yeah. When they sent through the ah. thing through the uh, the crack, it oh. activated his latent powers and ah. yeah. sort of like restored that. him back to timeless child status. See, I yeah. enjoyed these cannons, but I feel like they've got to say it at some point. They've got to actually do yeah. a bit of the work. They themselves. should. I love that. That's great. Yeah, that would be a nice it, nation for it. It does feel like we're going to address the Timeless Child thing, which I know there was a lot of speculation that mm. it'd be swept under the rug and never dealt with again. Um, and regardless of how you feel about it, I always like it when shows are willing, or, you know, shows, films, what have you, are at least willing to deal with stuff that's out there like rather than just pretending it it didn't happen so i like I that it feels like there's a plan for what they're going to do with this now but it's one thing that rtd has said in an interview which i thought was kind of really interesting because it kind of is, i think it speaks a lot on how he runs doctor as a showrunner he's very much about kind of creating these kind of moments for people to talk about and people kind of don't need to understand the law to get into it. And he talked about the timeless mm. child when he was asked about it, why, you know, Oh, you've, you've chosen to uh, kind of keep that. And he goes, yeah, of course I have it, it happened. And yeah, but he said, it's like, the point is though, that the timeless child itself as a phrase doesn't really mean anything to, you know, your average person around the um, breakfast table. However, the concept that the doctors adopted opens it up to so many people. Everyone understands what adoption is. Mm -hmm. You've got people out there who've never been able to see themselves and doctor will be able to through that, like he's done with having the first kind of income black doctor, the first uh, you know, gay doctor who seems to be playing it as, as the doctor is gay at this point in his life for, you know, they've already said the doctor dances with everyone, but it's like they are playing it like i think there's a few references which kind of suggest that's where the sexual orientation of 15 sits we haven't had it established but it's sort of like yeah i like the fact that all that's included and it brings people to the table but the way he said it kind of suggested to me we aren't gonna get the timeless child explained we're not going to see that watch again i don't think rtd that's sort of what moffat might do but i think rtd is going to sort of like leave it there is my theory from that kind of interview someone yeah. could pick it up in the future if they want to yeah yeah We'll see. He's not going to well, discount it and change the law. He'll just... Like, no. He, I think he said something like, there's a thousand stories I can tell. I don't have to tell that one. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I also think that the beauty of it is, it's like, you know, um, again, like, this is why RTD, I think, made it so popular, was it, it, it wasn't anything which people need to watch every episode of, and you can still understand it. I do want some more meaty stuff, because I did enjoy that when, like, like you know, to your point... RTD chucked out loads of stuff when he talked about the time war. It was like, uh, I was there at the fall of Arcadia and he'd name these little things. And then it wasn't until Moffat came back, did the fifth or came in, did the 50th anniversary. And he brought all those references very cleverly and brought them together into a story. But you didn't, you know, need to necessarily know all the kind of back things. But he, he kind of likes, I think, playing with all the toys and putting it together. But um, I, I think that's why RTD is kind of probably more apt to kind of get uh, more viewers. And it's. It's landed quite well for for him, really, in terms of he established the idea of the Doctor being the last Time Lord and then um, Stephen Moffat 
undid it and brought Gallifrey back and everything. And then uh, between Moffat and Chibnall, they've managed to put it back where we were the first time. No, Russell Chibnall, did, Chibnall reset over. everything. He redid so, everything. So he, Rusty Davis gets to come in and say, yeah, it's the last of the Time Lords again, which is, you know, that's that's yeah. what he was writing for before. So it's worked out quite nicely that it's... Well, I also think what we are going to see is that RTD, like at least when he brings up a concept, he will explore, like I think he's done more, st even though he hasn't actually gone into the Timeless Child per se, he's done more with it and kind of fleshed it out more than the person who originated it, I think Chibnall did, ever did. Like, you know, we're going to talk in a bit about the kind of destruction of Gallifrey, which gets mentioned a few times. I, I want to save that to when we get to the Devil's Court because there's a chunk in there. But... Like, that was all just happening off screen, which was just maddening to me. Like, you're going to have Gallifrey destroyed for a second time, which is already a bit ripey, and then you just have it happening off screen. Oh, yeah, because Gallifrey's just that easy to destroy, <laughs> whereas RTD's uh, come up with some more times. Time. Let's bring BBC in now. see one about uh, the Zulu war, where the three men are sat in the tent, and they says, what's it like out there? Well, there's thousands of them out there. Well, should we go out? Huh. out? No, 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 no. Like, no, we don't have budget <laughs> for that. <laughs> But that's it. It's like, I mean, let's do it while we're here. Like, uh, but it's like, you know, when he goes about the kind of like wa the Genesis wave that happened after Gallifrey was destroyed, that's a huge, like, I feel like I'm there. I never felt like that with a timeless child before. It just felt like it was just when, all happening. And the destruction when of Gallifrey. did that happen? The destruction of Gallifrey. When, when did that happen again? Uh, like, what, the they, brought the it, last, they brought it back in the episode? fifth year. Yeah. Ah, was yeah. so it was the master who did it this time. Yeah, the master just destroyed Gallifrey, which apparently was really easy, but he'd never right. done it. Before. Okay. Yeah, the cyber Some genetic, genetic cyber kicks. Yeah. But no like, way. you know, it just really was just like, oh, it's just gone now. Basically, just just happened. Whereas again, I love this idea. Of like, not only did they destroy, it, but he used a weapon so powerful it echoed out to potentially destroy every time room, which I think again. Yeah, that was an interesting did, idea. RTD loves his absolutes. When he talks about the destruction of Gallifrey, he wants everyone dead. He wants all the time we're going. He doesn't want any room for another one to be out there unless he chooses to bring the master back, obviously. But it's like, I, you know, he, he always deals with these extreme terms. And I just thought it was just so much more interesting. And again, we may as well just tackle this while we're in the kind of vicinity of talking about Gallifrey. Very interesting that Susan might still be out there. I really hope they do bring her back. It would be nice. Like, uh, that's always been out there as a possibility. Do we think Anita Dobson's going to be Susan? I never thought hmm. that, but interesting. interesting oh, is that too? Is that is that too obvious? I don't. I don't know. Hey, I, don't know. I know there's a lot of sort of online speculation that that Susan is the one who waits and is also going to be Anita Dobson's character from the Christmas special, and it feels maybe a little bit. To uh, yeah, I wouldn't have thought Russell T Davis would want to put something out there that people would work out that quickly. Um, he usually likes to sort of play the long game with his seasonal act. But, so. but Saxon. Yeah, well, I think there's a version of that, but we'll we'll get to that when we get yeah, to it. But. We've got got that coming, but yeah, it's, I mean, uh, they, there is in the trailer there is a Susan which the Doctor's talking to. If you watch the trailer for season one, so that could be, uh, you know, it's 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 just interesting that it's out there. I I, I kind of hope I hope he does feature in some way. It just feels like one of the ones which why is no one ever featured on TV? She's brought back in some audio drums and stuff, but um, yeah. Uh, so, a quick point on that. Now you brought up uh, Anita Dobson. Yeah. The only people who've addressed the camera yep. are from the other dimension. Well, Neil Dobson. Patrick Harris. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Neil Patrick Harris. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's from another dimension. Um, Jinx Monsoon. Yep. The Doctor, who is from, as far as they can tell, not from this universe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Anita Dobson. At the yeah. end of the Christmas episode, she addresses the camera. Yeah, good point. Is she like another veil of, you know, the toy maker? Is she another child of the toy maker? I did and enjoy um... the doctor as well. And well, I was just going to say like, someone who I think. Oh, sorry, sorry. You go, Jim. 
No, I was just going to say the the doctor addressed the camera way back in the William Hartnell days, did they not? To wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Yes. Yeah, so um, I know about this fourth wall breaking, it's not new. Like, uh, which, you know, there's no way we can argue that was part of the plan when they did that, but that it'd be a pretty nifty tie in if you go, wow, they've took that thing from all that time ago. And, but yeah, and a very Merry Christmas to you at home, too. I believe it was something like that. Very 60s. Well, yeah. I was going to say, uh, two comments from, um, uh, I know Jim knows him. You, you probably do as well, Jack. Uh, Ed uh, Fortune, who uh, writes for yeah. Starburst magazine, and he put two things which I rather enjoyed. He goes like, uh, "Thanks, RTD. You can uh, pay for my new fourth wall or something along these lines," which I thought was mm. quite funny on Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was very kind of glowing about the episode. But I just thought it was funny, uh, and he did say it's like it did sort of almost feel like these two were. Um, a new spin on, on episodes you could have seen in the 60s because there were was that kind of weird whacking. I mean, you got one episode where you went into storybooks in the um in the Troughton era. So this really isn't a million miles away from that, it's just a new twist. So yeah, anyone who's game po face, just remember, just watch some old Hartnells. May not be the same kind of pace, but there's a lot of the kind of shenanigans which we get here. Uh, and by which I just use an umbrella term for kind of fun little silly things, which which we already saw in the past. In fact, the Beatles almost appeared back in uh, the Hartnell era. They appear on the view screen, but originally they were set to possibly have a cameo. So just a little fun fact there. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we get a little allusion to Star Trek, which um, like uh, as uh, you guys will know, they had um, the uh, crossover in the uh, comics, which was... Yeah, a again. simulation two simulation. or something, mm. simulation squared, something like that. Yeah, Borg and the so, Cybermen. They did indeed. Um, but yeah, I think it's, some people were like um, saying that it might be a case of like, oh, will we see a Star Trek crossover? I don't think so, but I would love to have an episode. How cool would it be if two of the longest running like franchises you got Doc Two visiting the uh, shooting of the first uh, episode of Star Trek? That Wouldn't would that be, be cool, and that that would be a really nice way of doing it. Um, yeah. But then, I, I, yeah, you see, I don't know. I mean, if we, we're talking about breaking the fourth wall, and now we've got the Doctor talking about Star Trek as though it's a, a real thing. I don't, you know, how meta are we going to go? Are we gonna are we going to acknowledge? that Doctor Who is a fiction within its own fiction mm -hmm. and then if that kicks open all the doors. I don't, you know, I don't... If, if you listen part to Part of me would listen. love to see it, part of me not so much. I would just say the line which he says isn't, let's go to, like, uh, on, on the end point. He goes... They, she mentions Star Trek and then he goes, oh, yeah, I, we should visit them one day, which could just yeah. mean the filming. It isn't necessarily... Because I don't like the idea mm. they... Like, I, I don't mind it for comics. But I think they're two very different visions of the future, both of which I love. They're my two favorite. But I never really wanted to cross over only because, like, in real, you know, live action, because I think they are two different kind of visions, is my only feeling. Yeah, uh, but but I, I could see Shooty Gatwood's Doctor on the bridge of the Enterprise in Strange New Worlds. I could see that working. Well, it takes some very good writing. crazier each year. They've done... You know, um, where they were in the fantasy world in Strange New Worlds and they did the musical. Yeah. They've apparently there you done go. something that's going to top that in three. They've been renewed for season four. There you go, yeah, Doctor. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I just, I think there's so much established. It's probably just because, like, I'm. I'm it's like, not going to happen. Think, I, don't I know think we need so story. much about the lore of each of them that is so much which would cancel the other out. Yeah. And then the Borg exist and the, and the Cybermen exist over there. It's. Um, Anyway, uh, let's get into the babies, though. Space babies. So uh, we get onto the ship. Uh, Ruby suggests the kind of time frame which they want to go to. I did really enjoy this idea that that it's a kind of like it's a way of repopulating a world. So they kind of kind of grow humans, basically, to repopulate the world. And two very big concepts. I think it's really interesting because the one thing that Chibnall got called out for by some fans is that he made too many of the kind of uh, they weren't allegories, they were just on the nose like this, the issue we're dealing with. Whereas RTD in one scene got in um, the fact they couldn't destroy the babies because they were already kind of like being grown, which is very much what's happening in America right now. 
Uh, and what was the one? Sorry, there was one in the UK in the same breath, which was um... talk about immigration. Uh, how there's of course, immigration, no yeah, basically have to get there the to be a refugee. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. Thank you. But yeah, two like two of the biggest issues in in each of the countries, and immigration also a very big deal in America. <laughs> He really did kind of put in a lot there, but it's kind of interesting that people who choose not to can choose not to see it <laughs> in the way we've done the past. Yeah, I think it was also pretty quick. It wasn't kind of dwelt on. Like the the thing about the the babies, that the way it was phrased really confused me at first because they said, well you know, we, we we start the process and then you're not allowed to turn the process off and then no one will look after them. And I was like, wait a minute, are they are they saying that we we should stop people from having babies? And I was like, oh no, okay, I get right. Yeah. yeah. But it, it is, took me a minute. <laughs> it's a proper allegory for the Americans though, like you say, because yeah. they've got it at the minute that we don't want anyone to have an abortion. And then someone raised to them, well, what about if they're not going to be raised correctly when they're born? Well, that's the mother's problem. Well, and also, so, they've well, just got into the, they've gone into landmine recently, which I don't know even if this had happened when they would have been writing this. I think this, because and they were shot quite a while ago, but recently they've got into a very similar situation to this in a way, in that uh, they were talking about frozen embryos counting as babies, which has created a huge shitstorm in America. Mm. It was in one um, state, I think, think Alabama, but I'm not sure. But now people are arguing should it be made? Arizona. Oh, sorry. I knew it was one of the A ones. <laughs> but yeah, it's um but it's kind of interesting that it's like, yeah, while they're having this huge argument in that state, now other states are having that, that argument's bringing up and it's just it shows where do you stop with this? So it's like again it was more pressing than even I think they were intending to be. I don't know if even mm. RTD would have made it that hot button, but it really felt like that that stuck out to me a mile out. Uh the thing I didn't get, though, to, to move it on a little bit, I like I might miss something here, but it felt like they explained that the babies get kind of like farmed and born here. And because they were left on their own, something different happened. But I, I, I didn't hear where they explained why they're super intelligent babies. Because they're six, but they've never grown. So yeah, but like they, they didn't sound like six. That, that's they sounded advanced for six year olds to me. Yeah, and and, and how, what, been why did it stop them growing? Why did it stop them from growing, though? Never said. Only thing I could assume That's, is that yeah. everything were broken. It's right. like there must have been like a maturation uh, change. Yeah, the doctor does that. say everything's broken. He says that to Ruby at yeah, one point. But it's like, so maybe. They established that they were six. Again, they seem advanced for six. But even like, say the six year olds and their bodies just haven't grown. It never really, I don't know, it just seemed weird they didn't expressly say why their bodies hadn't grown mm. yeah, again it's another thing you can piece together but it seemed like a big thing not to mention i think that was a bit of a setup just so he could do the chat with the captain baby yeah when she's going on about not being grown and i'm i'm different and it's like no everybody's all right everyone's fine you're all great you're all little babies everyone's unique and it's like i suppose it set, set him up well to do his little speech to her and cheer her up yeah, I mean, I love that. And I do love, like, give me just an hour of shooting just talking to babies. Like, his doctor seems just, just endlessly charming uh, doing that. But I could have done with maybe only, like, two dozen times of him saying the phrase space babies. It was every yeah. sentence. Like, yeah. we get it. <laughs> I liked the way the doctor almost didn't know how to act around babies because on the one hand he's very just very excited and happy and you know as you would expect but then on the other hand he's like i'm going to show you the bogeyman and i'm going to scare you and he's taking delight in scaring the babies which was uh you know not necessarily yeah. a trait and it's ruby's going no no turn it off doctor he's going ha, ha, ha. and later on not, they not blame quite Lay on, they blame Ruby for that. I thought the same. I thought that is totally the doctor's fault. The doctor was oh, the, the, no, the doctor like, was, so, was enjoying so seeing. But like later on, when when the baby goes off to um to stop the monster because of what Ruby said, it's like that's not on her. That's on the doctor for scaring the shit out of them, <laughs> like quite literally <laughs> by the sounds of things. And then her having to rescue the situation, she wouldn't have said that mm. if he had been being a dick. It's his fault. Yeah, he was a well. bit. 
Yeah. Ewan's first episode of Doctor Who. Oh, there we go. Love the bogeyman. Wasn't scared <laughs> at was... all. It was flashing up on screen and screaming and everything, and he just went, <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, yeah, that's all right, isn't it? <laughs> we're just like, all right, you're meant to be younger than the kids who are screaming. <laughs> I actually thought it was one of the scarier looking <laughs> ones yes, for having Doctor I Who thought, in a while. That's it. I thought that's it. We're done. He will not sit and watch Doctor Who with me ever again because of the bogeyman. I was going to have nine. Well, no, I think if he's all right with the bogeyman, Jack, then might have to be alien next week. I mean, uh... Uh, I've been trying to do that since we were three years old. <laughs> <laughs> I did think this was better done than the. I mean, by the way, I didn't mind the Slovene, but I thought they worked better than the Sarah Jane Adventures than Doctor Who. Yeah, but, like I thought they're farting thing like it was okay as a joke but then it was just it was overplayed it felt to me and it was a bit yeah that like, was all they did yeah it made the whole episode just just very kind of crunchy whereas this was nicely used where you use the bogeyman turns out to be made of bogeys and you use the kind of fart joke at the end where it's like basically a fart their way out of danger from the methane i thought it was nice it was mm -hmm. much better peppered in so it's kind of fun for the kids but it didn't intrude with the drama in the way i felt the savine kind of had a tendency to do i think that's, that's why the slovene have never returned and they look too cute as well this at least looked badass and teethy and apparently not scary to you but for the rest of us uh, mere mortals not uh, on the you scale of bravery i think i would have been scared by that as a kid <laughs> me too yeah i thought it was a decent monster <laughs> like because let, let's be honest even in the modern era of doctor who it, a lot of the monsters still look a bit naff but th this one didn't. This looked actually like a, a good horror special effect. Yeah, it's, yeah I've I seen enjoyed far it. far worse in far more expensive products. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, there was... And again, the whole kind of setup with the babies was really nice. We then get the bit with the nanny. Now, I, I, I get the kind of theory which RTD's going for that she didn't want them to see her die and her to see them die because obviously we get the kind of like the uh, computer version then we find out it's a real person they follow her to where where they said to, she mm -hmm. said to go but what kind of sadist just watches babies for six years and doesn't give them hug like they established that's their first ever hug and she doesn't at any point when she's watching them, she hates the idea of them seeing her die but she'll happily watch them cry themselves to sleep because they've never in their lives had a hug that seemed mean to me <laughs> And what were they doing for the first few years before they could operate this stuff, before they were six? It feels like there's something missing here that says that they had their intellect yeah. from the beginning. I'm going to assume she set up all of those contraptions for them. Yeah. Yeah. And then taught them how... But like I said, I'm assuming it. She never. She didn't do a throwaway line to the Doctor and Ruby and say, you know, I had to distract them all when they were three years old to set up all these buttons while they were yeah, out of the room. I've... They almost caught me. Or, you know, so yeah, and they, they think the they never had a hug. I hugged them lots of times when they were babies. You know, just something to show she mm. didn't just sit there and watch them be on their own for six years. That, that's worse than them seeing you die one day, is never giving them any emotional contact. I thought that was just really weird. <laughs> like I didn't jibe with that at all. It is weird, and it, it her presence hiding from them doesn't add a lot to the episode so mm. it, you know you could have taken her out and it not made a huge amount of difference so it makes you wonder why like what purpose did it serve really I don't I mean, know I mean, she's I... needed for the denouement because we need someone to, to be trying to kill the, the monster true true for it to work which that was a very weird ending with yeah, suddenly I mean, stops her and then she breaks down and starts crying and as if she's just realized that she was killing a baby but she wasn't killing a baby she was killing a living pile of snot they, said, they well, kind of it felt like the shoehorned in at the end there that it's and all the babies too. suddenly liked the bogeyman very quickly this is what i mean seems like there's stuff missing like, you know, like yeah, like, like, yeah. Out. It tied it up in a bow, but never told you where the laces came from. Yeah. Oh, good one. Oh, yeah. Ooh, but yeah, because yeah, it was. I get the idea of well, it's another life form, and you know that's Doctor Who's thing, isn't it? That like you know the monster isn't always a monster, and 
all of this stuff. But it's like, but that that's a monster that five minutes ago has trashed one of them's wheel, yeah. uh, not wheelchair, the uh, buggy, you know. Yeah. So th- that that was a pretty bad monster. And then suddenly it's it's your favourite monster, and don't worry, it's okay. Yeah. And I, I didn't fully buy it. I just needed a bit more. Like, I think you could get there. And I love the idea that the Doctor's now, like, whereas the Doctor's always been about de- defeating the monster, this Doctor is so empathetic. He can save even the monster, like Ruby says. It's like, no, you save everyone. Like, if they'd introduced that a bit earlier, maybe had a situation where the baby's going, it's like, but it's an evil monster. It's like, and the Doctor's saying, it's like, you know what? I've met so many monsters and some of them you can really, you know, him saying something Mm. about reaching to someone, like you think they're a monster, but then you find out they're not as bad as you think they're, as opposed to trying to scare them, he could have been doing that in that scene. I think you would have had to have removed the fact that it's (laughs) trashed one of them's push chair, Mm. because that, that's a level of, you know, obviously it's off screen, but that's an attack on an infant. And that you know that that's pretty hard to come back from. Oh, no, no, so I, I think you would have had to have taken that element out. No, I can build on that. I think that's actually a really good point. You show maybe all this destructive, all these destructive things that it does. Have a camera like, oh, it's like it's filming, but we can't access it. And then you find the video footage, and then you see what it's doing is like actually it ran through and pushed the wheelchair out of the way and kind of clawed it, as opposed to yeah. And just, you yeah, know, you could have done something. Oh, God, it wasn't yeah. trying to be yeah. evil all this time. It was just, it was playing its part. It's like you know, the safety's worn. It can never actually kill anyone. You know, yeah, it, I mean, it was just playing a part. As it was we going all for were. a cuddle. Yeah, yeah, you know, what I mean? it's, it's first hook. <laughs> but yeah, or, not, know, not it's to... wrong is to scare them not to actually kill. You know, the safety was there, and it's been controlled to do this. You know, whereas like if you switch off the chip in its brain, it can be. You know, there's so many yeah. ways in which you could have brought that round, and because. The moment was there at the end. It just, you didn't get the laces, as you say, Jack. Yeah, your story could have time been time. like the the devil in the dark from the original Star Trek, where the monster turns out not to be a monster. But maybe would that have been a bit too much to to have in one 45-minute episode along with all the Space Baby stuff? But then the answer is don't, don't put that, don't put the snot monster in just have like there being a hole in the hull or something that's the danger if you've not got space to tell that story as well no pun intended with space but you know it don't cram that in if you're not gonna pay it off properly I think you should could have just been a bit more economical with the other bits you just kind of again cut mm. out the dog being trying to scare the shit out of the babies like it was kind of fun but we didn't really need it it's a few bits like could that you could have trimmed down could have uh, neatened up the intro to the babies so you know maybe cut a dozen mentions of the word space babies out there that would have made like quite a bit of time for the About six says. minutes of time there <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. You know, and it's to like... be fair the the babies don't know that they're space babies to them they're just <laughs> babies because they, they don't know babies that are not space babies so the yeah. doctor constantly correcting himself going oh sorry space babies like the babies are not going to be offended if you just call them babies yeah I mean, I, I think it was just, it's something which RTD said, I think when it was, yeah, it was when David Tennant regenerated in, he said, oh, there was loads of references where I had him saying, I'm the doctor. But then when I saw him do it, I, I realized you didn't need that. I wish he made the same realization. We've got Shooty being so evuncular, so enthusiastic, so wonderfully kind of like enthusiastic as the doctor. We've already seen it. And like, we've seen him celebrate the words space babies a couple of times. We don't need all the other references. I feel like you could have cut that down to make that space because we've already got that. Like, shoot is doing it. You do not need to give him the lines to make him look enthusiastic. While we're talking about that, like, he's just fantastic, isn't he? Like, I, I just... I love his charisma. He's just so engaging. And he doesn't come across like... A lot of the time when you get the energetic, infused Doctor, you immediately compare it to David Tennant's portrayal. And I'm not getting that with him. I'm like, no, this is his Doctor completely. And yeah, I love it. Yeah, I mean, I think that the worst one who suffered from that was Jodie, only for the fact that... Sorry, I'm like I, I don't. I'm not just here to bash the chimney. If people loved it, please, I'm not insulting you. But for me, it felt like there were so many copied elements. 
it sometimes felt like she was copying him because of the writing, not because of her portrayal. Um, yeah. Whereas, like, yeah, Shooty just he he they brought in so much of his personality, or he has, that it just um it's instantly him as the doctor. It's no one, it could be no one else playing this version of the doctor. Yeah, it reminds me so much of like the character who plays Eric in sex education mm -hmm. as well. It's like you can tell that's his sort of natural level. Yes. It's, yeah. Yeah. He's got an exuberance that he's brought to the role, but it's also probably just how he walks down the street when he's talking to his best friends. You know, it's like, yeah, I mean, I don't and feel I, like he's turning a switch on to become. But uh, uh, I feel, I feel like a, a gravitas to him as the doctor that I didn't get from sex education. And I think, I think that's good that he's managed to channel that. Yeah. I mean, it was when, for me, it was when I saw, I think it was either in the first or second episode of Sex Education, where there was this kind of like really emotional bit he had with his family about kind of, uh, you know, uh, them not knowing about his being gay and all this. I, I, I thought that was the first moment where I was like, oh, there, there's the doctor. You know, I can, I can see how he might portray the doctor and it's kind of different again. But yeah, it's, um, I, I, and it was also like things like, if you told me the doctor was going to be saying babes to everyone, <laughs> I might go, Oh, okay, let's see about it. Okay, Any babes. other doctor, it would have sounded wrong. To him, I think it'd be wrong if he did. Like, That's it's just it. so much it, him. It's, it's yeah. so good. It doesn't it? sound forced, whereas when you had yeah. Jodie Whittaker saying, yeah, fam, it, yeah. it just felt cringy. Um, yes. But this feels natural. Yeah. yeah I was just like going to say exactly the same. Yeah. Although now you just keep reminding me of Jodie's thinking. Puzzled everything face it. <laughs> oh, just one little note, just for it. I mean, we've got nothing on it, but I just enjoyed the doctor saying spurs. <laughs> it was very fun. <laughs> um, just trying to skip through a few notes which we've already covered. Oh, yeah, Ruby gets the key to the TARDIS, of course. Of I course. Very nicely played. She, I like the fact that she was like, oh, but we almost died, but we didn't, though. So this is going to be really fun. <laughs> she goes in. We established that they can't go back to that point, which we, as kind of regular fans, need. I think felt that until the season the finale. Well, obviously, um, <laughs> and uh, oh, and we didn't mention before, which we see here, where we get Snow suddenly appearing in the Doctor earlier on. Yeah, yes. but slightly different of when he was uh, in the past. So yeah, I think we've got uh, obviously some on running uh, kind of themes from Ruby yeah. as well. So we've got the babies, and we're going to see it in the next episode. So yeah, anyone got anything else just before we move on to the Devil's Court? Anything else on Just ladies? on Ruby and you know, you, you talked about earlier on, like, you know, you can see elements of Russell T. Davis's prior work here and one of the tropes, and it wasn't just Russell T. Davis, Stephen Moffat did it as well, is the idea that the companion is basically the most important person in the universe and they have some sort of divine power and it, i i want to go back to the companion just being a person from earth and yeah. it, I, I really don't feel like we're going to get that with ruby and you know i'm not against it per se but it just feels out of the modern companions rose became the bad wolf and the bloody bloody blah um, and then obviously all the stuff that happened with Donna and then she became the Doctor Donna and so on the and so forth. Waited. And yeah, yeah, and the girl who went and you had Clara who was in all the different points in time and what happened with uh Capaldi's Bill. second companion, Bill, didn't, Bill. didn't she Bill become became something? she ended up touring the galaxy with a star? But in yes. all fairness, she wasn't the big thing. In all fairness, she was pretty much playing no. the series as just True. a companion, which was nice, to your point. I, I didn't. But, but yeah. I think that's why we she have, was such a We have forgotten Martha. Martha. Ma Martha was normal. That's why <laughs> oh, I, no, she I walked the up. earth to save it. Oh, yeah. She did, yeah. but she did so in a human way. <laughs> so I'll, 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 okay. I'll give you Martha. But So <laughs> at least every other companion has had some form of prophecy yeah. or supernatural power or divine yeah and it's just okay you know 
they don't I, all I, I have to like leave that. Actually, and, and this isn't meant to correct you, but this I feel this speaks to your point. I did rather enjoy it when you had Nardle as well for the same reason because he was mm. Nardle and Bill were both fairly just they were who yeah. they were. They weren't something else. And I think that era was very popular in Capaldi's time because people felt like they were just getting an adventure of the week. I'd actually really like another alien companion because people have said, I wouldn't like, mind oh that. yeah, but you need the, the doctor to be like the human to be explaining it and like talking about human turns and alien plants. But why not just have the doctor explain it to the companion? Oh, this is earth. This is, this is another, pl-. like you can still explain it. You don't have to you can have still do that. Tonight. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, I obviously let it play out and I'm sure it'll be great. But I I just felt like I could have lived without it this time round. You know, for a new doctor, let's just have a regular companion to begin with. But you know, oh, the, this what, is what why Russell C. Davis only... makes the big books and I don't. You know, he, he will have a plan for this and it'll be great, I'm sure. I mean she's only here what for this season and half of the next a bit of the next one or yeah, something, the but there seems to be replaced. a lot of the, but there seems to be a lot of contradictory stuff around that, and I don't know how much of it is deliberate false information they're putting out there, and how much of it is speculate. So, yeah, no so idea. A lot, of, a lot of reports that she didn't gel on set during first season. One yeah, time. but then yeah. there's been other reports saying that's a load of rubbish, and actually, you're going to have the new companion and her side by side. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. I think I think it's going to be a lot of cross. I I mean, to be honest, it could just be as simple. I mean, it might just be all things are a bit true. So it's like might be just that. Mm. Yeah, you know, she enjoyed the first season, but it wasn't kind of quite clicking the way they wanted to, or she wasn't enjoying as much she thought. So she agreed to be in half the next when you get a nice handover. I just think people put a lot of kind of emotive things of like, oh, she was hated on set. Well, maybe she just didn't gel with the role. Like, or you know, I mean, she seems to be doing very well in the role, not not in something acting, but like gel with the. Um, the, the filming and with the kind of like the fast pace of kind of doing Doctor Who film. Um, we'll I think find it's probably out. not as dramatic as yeah. people kind of make out as the only thing. Uh, oh, very quickly, uh, before we move to the Devil's Court, I just love it when the Nan, when you go go to uh, Ruby's family and uh, just before the TARDIS lands, I'm going, well, this isn't much fun. Like uh, this doctor's like whisk away my, uh, my daughter on Christmas. And then the Nan who was just flirting in her timeline has just been flirting with the doctor about an hour ago. It's like sucking through her teeth. Yeah. Like, you know, like almost to say, I always knew he was a wrong and no, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. Uh, Devil's Court. Let's go on. Um, yeah. So we get, uh, Start off in 1925 with the piano teacher having an instant le- uh, lesson when Jinx uh, pops out the piano and, oh yeah, I've just put the guy who teaches the piano looks like uh, Walter from the Beano. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Yes, he does. We, we've got Jinx's entrance and I thought, just man, there wasn't a single bit of scenery that she, that, sorry, they did not have a gnaw on. And they enjoyed every moment of it, and so did I. I thought it was perfect. I actually like this a lot better than when they've made the master this um, campion song dance. I think the master, for me, I know the master has been camp in some other incarnations, but I don't think they were playing camp. It was just the acting style of the time was very large and very mm-hmm. Shakespearean. Yeah. Whereas the master's thing is, the master is evil. Like, uh, with, Sel- with Selena Gomez, sorry, with uh, Michelle Gomez even, that would have been very different casting. But with Michelle Gomez, I felt like, they did a good compromise of that where it was a bit nuts, but you really got the feeling like it was scary. You didn't know if she was unhinged rather than yeah. yeah. It wasn't just the camp, whereas this <clears> character, <throat> it's a brand new character. Jinx was perfect, and like the music's like like it felt like she had stepped out in musical. Like when she goes, it was so sad, Timothy! and like ridiculously large. But because it's a music episode, it felt like that was delivered in the stage style of a stage show and it just worked really nicely but anyway uh your first impressions of uh, jinx monsoon as maestro guys i yeah. agree with you really really good screen pre- i'm not familiar with jinx monsoon's other work no. um but as an actor within this thought the screen presence was fantastic there was a a sinister air to the performance which was needed and genuinely came across as quite chilling and threatening to the doctor which the the bad guys don't always pull off 
Um, I liked the idea of it being this devil's cord and that somehow draws something into the universe. Like, I, I don't know quite where they're going with all of it. Since this thing Rusty Davis has talked about, about, you know, this idea of these other beings and everything. But I, if this is sort of our introduction to what the the big bads are going to be. I thought it was really, really effective. Yeah. I will say as well, with the devil's cord, all I could think of when he started was uh, Bill Bailey. When <laughs> he talks about uh, the devil's cord, and he says, do, do, do. <laughs> my, lungs are inf- he goes, my lungs are inflamed with sexual lust. <laughs> that's why they ban- That's why they banned it. <laughs> and nice. It's too sexy of a cord. I, it was just lovely. I mean, I, to be honest with you, after watching this, because uh, I thought in the Christmas episode, the Goblin song worked very nicely, was very nicely fitted into it. I felt, if anything, this episode could have just been an out-and-out musical episode. I really would have enjoyed it. I know you'd have to retool what was happening, but you could say mm-hmm. uh, Maestro was stealing the music as, like, in real time as we're seeing it, and, like, the music, like, she stole it as people sang. You could have a, a song with Sierra. Yeah, yeah, it'd be pretty much like, a Buffy episode. But, I, think yeah. its own, I think they could have made it its own still. But like then they it could have done. a bit more of a Beatles episode because you could have put in a couple of new songs in the Beatles style and just said, well, the reason why you've never heard these is because they now can't be performed again. Like to begin with, Ruby's wondering why we're hearing all these Beatles songs that we've never heard before. And that's because they get sealed around this event or something. Because as it was, I felt the Beatles got really lost in this. I really to say to... all the publicity in advance has been this is the Beatles episode, this is the Beatles episode, look who we've cast as the Beatles, the Beatles are Abbey in this Road, one. Abbey, Abbey Road, oh. And yeah, they're in it for a, a few minutes. And they don't even look like the Beatles. I mean, if you're going to just have no, them in that don't. small apart, <laughs> this will get some people yeah. to look like them. Mm. That's kind of what the Chippenhall era did well with like the Rosa Parks episode. I love Rosa Parks was a very important part. It of was that episode. very yeah. much about Rosa Parks, the episode. And yeah, promoting it as it's the Rosa Parks episode. This is the Beatles episode. Well, where are they? Well, you'll see them for a couple of minutes, and then at the end they'll turn up and you know, oh, I wonder what these floating things are here. Oh, I'm gonna play it. Oh, we've we've won the day. Oh, now, music. I know. I, I'm sorry, we are jumping ahead to that bit, but since we mentioned <laughs> yeah. it, like. I know, obviously, well, it was a right issue. The Beatles two scenes in one. Yeah, they, they've talked about the fact we couldn't get any Beatles songs because it'd be so expensive. Yeah. But it just felt like what the fact that they make the music that banishes um, Maestro, it, it should have been the opening to Penny Lane or so, you know, just something. It, it should have been a Beatles tune that they played well, in that moment. Bit. But well, I get I why thought, it's not yeah. because of the no, rights. But, like, but... but but if if you have them like because they're such musical genius, because I didn't really buy it in this situation. I thought the doctor was the wrong person to solve this. It's basically solves it, and, and I know we're going to do this all. Ask about it. We will go back to the earlier bits in a minute. But let's just do this kind of like st- through line for the Beatles. It's like I don't think because the doctors lived a long time and like. And they didn't really have him even doing any of the Gallifrey and usual, like, ooh, and like waving his hands over the keys. So he, he senses terrible, them. Man. Like, like I, I, ex- I at least wanted that if they're going to do that route. But there's no reason why the Doctor's particularly knows this music. There's no reason for him to. No. And you've and... got the Beatles there. So why not? Well, that was them? there. As I say, as opposed to yeah. doing the twist at the end, which was really just, it was literally tacked on after the episode. Instead, you could have had this written into it, have it been Beatles led, had it been the Beatles style. So even though you can't afford Penny Lane, you could yeah. get like like Mitch Ben. There was an audio play, there's a comedian called Mitch Ben, huge Beatles fan. He does uh, comedy songs. He did the Now Show on radio uh, a few years back. And what you could have done is like he on, uh, they did an audio one, which was called Fanfare for the Common Men for the uh, 50th anniversary. It was one of the specials which Big Finish did. And they had him write a few, like, I think it was him who wrote them. But anyways, in the episode, there was a few Beatles-esque songs. You could have so done something like that here. 
And even if you can't afford the songs, it would have felt like the Beatles and, were writing them. And again, yeah, then you've got a perfect reason why it's like, well, if you played any of those again, you'd be killing time. So, you know, write some other ones. How about Penny Lane? <laughs> you know, it's like, have you some know what? You, you could have got away with, you could have cut away from it, but you could have had, you know, Paul McCartney and John Lennon talking, oh, what are we going to play? And you could have had them just hitting a first note. Yes. And then it's open to interpretation, you know, but, but it can be very clear what song they're about to start playing from one note. But the lawyers had have a hard time going, you know, you can say, well, all they did was play a G. You can't prove that I know nothing about music. I don't know if a G's a thing. Well, See, yeah, I was wondering when I, they said a G, a G, and another G or whatever, I was wondering if that did make out anything. This, this is the thing I was going to go for. I had two endings in my head when we were watching it. One, when he talks to Paul and... He says, oh, I had a, a G, an E, a G, a G, and a C, and it sounded like, I love you. Or I thought, right, that's going to be the chord that gets rid of mm. Jinx. Yeah, He's just nice. said that his belly didn't deep in his head, and yeah. he hears it, and it's coming out, and it's like, right. And then when he started pressing it, I'm like, that's not a G, that's not an E. <laughs> so, and then <laughs> yeah. it went on to like six or seven notes. I'm like, oh, it's not that. Right. But then I thought, well, another good way would have been to see if you could use a little bit of a Beatles song just to start, and then him say, the Beatles are played for hundreds of years on Earth. So every, at any one moment in time, there's almost always this song playing somewhere on Earth, so Jinx will never, uh, Maestro will never return. That would have been because great. Because this yeah. music yeah. is always playing. It's like they become yeah. so yeah. big that at any moment in time, this is playing on Earth. Yeah. I, yeah, I just think that would have been great. Done to crystallize them into this episode that wasn't done. But we will get back to this ending in a bit. We're just going to go right back to the and start was, of the episode. Yeah, yeah it's a little bit. one well, more well, thing I, on that. But as soon as they said it needs a genius, you were like, well, clearly the Beatles are going to come back and, do, you know... Uh, anyway yeah 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 no i agree uh i do have to if we're going back to the beginning um sorry just i i forgot to say at the beginning by the way i'm dr screen willow is joining me here uh that's my doggy who's off screen at the moment she did want me to point out that it was a mistake that they're trying to establish that the beatles have lost their singing uh songwriting abilities and the first oh, thing they dog. play was an absolute banger about a dog i mean like you know uh, <clears throat> what was wrong with that it was it was perfect I have a dog. This is a dog I love. Yeah, if I say it was bad, she will. I will not. I enjoyed it. I thought that was fine. It was better than some of the B tracks rubbish that they released when they were in their experimental phase. Silla's performance in the next studio. Oh, yeah. It didn't sound anything like Silla, though. Like that maddened me. It's like you're only going to have them in one scene. At least get someone who's got. Silla's voice. But she that. looked more like Scylla than they looked like... Um, yeah. they, they, the that's Beatles. true. <laughs> Funny, I would have made them look like the Beatles, but I would have heard, had her because, yeah, like, Scylla's... Now, don't get me wrong, obviously the Beatles have a very distinctive voice, but there's quite a few people who could do a version of the Beatles' voice, like, some approximation. You probably could have, mm. like... And I thought their approximation of the Beatles' voice wasn't too bad. But Scylla is just... I. I've rarely heard anyone who can. I've, I've, I can't think of any time I've heard someone like uh, parrot like the way Sil's voice works. It's like you know, Did that uh, many people movie, try and do that. Though? Maybe that's it. Maybe that's. I mean, it. Yeah, you don't see. I'm she's got really. Say, oh. You don't often see like tonight only the Scylla Black tribute. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, not. Right, right. <laughs> okay, maybe. Maybe we should start one. I know. I just I, I found her voice always so striking. I thought it was also so striking that it was so different to how she spoke as well. It just mm. always sounded very I don't know. Just it really took me out of it. it's like that doesn't sound anything like her voice. And if you're doing a song which isn't hers, <laughs> the only thing we've got to go by is, is the fact they call a seller. It's like in the first scene, I did notice they were going, it's like, come on then, George. All right then, Ringo. You know, it's like they never mm. checked each other. It's like yep, that because was they don't look story. like them, so <laughs> It could be any mop top from the uh, <laughs> It was actually the monkeys. <laughs> very, yeah. very easily could have been. Uh, 
then once we establish the Beatles and Silla can't sing anymore, we then go to the canteen. I did love the, the trolley thing was a nice bit of business. And I like the fact that Doctor, because, you know, of course, the first Doctor lived through this exact time. He's going, it's like, a crown for a cup of tea. Bloody day life. So yeah, it's just really nice good. about the, the Doctor getting pissed off. He was getting overcharged a crown for a coffee or for a tea. Uh, and Ruby just joining in. Um, but yeah, then they do have a sit down with, with their respective Beatles. And I thought it was just a really nice thing. It really felt like, oh, brilliant, mm-hmm. we're going to build up something with these guys as opposed to them just appearing at the end. <laughs> no, like, that was your last like... scene with the Beatles yeah. for, for the time being. But, um, because you do just one, this one about the crown, yeah, crown for a cup of tea. They were just yep. pushing a tea trolley. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, what did they go and buy one? They had a tea trolley. <laughs> yeah, even the biscuits. They yeah. just gave gave the last one to the guy in the recording studio. <laughs> well, by the way, we talked about things which happened in both episodes. The Doctor again jams his his new Sonic, which I don't mind. By the way, I'm happy yeah. with it in the redesign. But like, and it also is really cool that it can kind of connect to things now. Like it's we've we've seen that used a bit, but it's like seems to. Yeah connecting to loads of boards and stuff uh but it happens two episodes in a row and the doctor leaves it and has to smash through to grab it again like he's getting yep. a bit clumsy with it is all i'm saying he's got his brand new sonic it's the biggest one yet and he keeps on losing it and apparently it had to be redesigned because it looked too much like a gun that's what yeah. like it. yeah it was, i think I, it I had to be redesigned because RPD. they want you to buy a new one i don't think it's necessarily anything to do with it looking like a gun i think no, it's no, no, just... not, not jody's looking like a gun apparently the original one they were going to oh well, yeah. it'd be good if like some production sketches came out it was just like a big, <laughs> big massive machine gun an <laughs> ar I'm just reaching for a random Sonic key, the first one which came. Don't right. brandish weapons on <laughs> well, a live one... stream. What are you doing? I don't know about the first. The, the, only thing I did... <laughs> the only thing I did think, I do get the motion. Like it has become almost like the Doctor is using it. Like as not, I'm not saying it looks like a gun, but he's using it in the same motion of like point and shoot. Possibly. It's become a sort of toy, and I like the fact that again, I'm not, I'm not saying that it looked too much like a gun to use. I'm just saying. It's kind of nice this breaks it up, so he has to use them. Yeah, I don't mind the reason. And you saw actually got something different. Yeah, absolutely fine with that. Yeah, and we're not having things down. They're scientific instruments, not (laughs) water pistols. Exactly. (laughs) Like even the the, uh, ward doctor himself called it out. You know, it it was being used a bit more like that. This forces them to use it a bit differently. And also, Sonic Screwdriver, it was that because handyman stuff and kind of like that was a symbol of manliness, which the Doctor was always a man back in the 60s. And it, it reflected the times. Now, having it look more like something that the, the young people recognize, of course you do that. Of course you give them something yeah. which is more of the time. And they, they're they into electronics. And that looks like, people said it looks like a games console thing. But it's like, yeah, because Kids know what that is. They don't oh, care about a screwdriver. You don't get many kids don't go down the road going, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna fix you with my screwdriver." Like how often? Whereas games we're gonna Sonic get a right? Sonic screwdriver with an LCD game built in, aren't we? And I will be all over it. I'm happy with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you get a Doctor Who game on there. They could actually make a good one for the first time. Absolutely. Anyway. <laughs> I'm also very disappointed though because new Sonic means no Sheffield Steel in it. Ah, it does. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Never apparently mind. they, they, yeah, they made this one in Southampton for me. But <laughs> made out of fish? <laughs> yeah, it's made out of a fish, that's it. <laughs> Can I just say yeah, that you remind me, reminded me then of um, one of my favourite things about the Sonic Screwdriver in the episode with uh, David Morrissey. Is it? Yes. David the, Morrissey. The where, one, where uh... he, yeah, where he has the screwdriver. And it's my Sonic Screwdriver. Well, what makes it Sonic? See? It, makes noise. it hits things. It makes a noise. Sonic. <laughs> yep. Oh, one thing we did miss as well is uh, it's very fun with the costumes. Like, uh, I know, yes. Jack, you've, and I kind of feel the same. You, I want to bring this up because you mentioned uh, when we were chatting before. Mm. There is something about, like, I hope there is enough episodes with the iconic 15th doctor kind of outfit so he's yeah. got his look but i love the fact these play and especially this like especially if you're gonna have shooty and you're gonna have those pecs you want to like you want to show them a lot of cool outfits 
And this was just nice. And they're kind of like the the afro because yeah. he says about like I've got lots of wigs. It was just so much fun. But Ewan said to me, just went, "Why is his hair long?" <laughs> Does he go back to the hairdressers afterwards? I went, no, it's a wig. And he went, oh, okay. And I'm like, it's all right, mate. You'll you'll understand when you go. So he just couldn't grasp why he went and put a wig on. Do you know what I was thinking? I thought when they said this wig, I didn't rub up against her and I didn't have a problem. But I did think it's like, I th I just assumed he was going to stimulate his hair follicle. Like he was going to use his sonic. Yeah, I his assumed he'd, that he had a hairdressing something on the TARDIS that could give you any hairdo you well, wanted. We, well, we know he don't, do, don't we, from when Matt Smith shaved his head when he was bored. Oh, yeah. And he had to wear a wig and he stored the key in the back of the wig. Because, of course, you've and got the like, regeneration scene where you've got the Doctor and the Companion are both bold underneath their wigs. Yeah, true. <laughs> Can I just say as well, while, while we're talking about them rocking the, the outfits and stuff like... You know, there's that old thing that they say, like, oh, you you feel old when policemen look young. Look young. Um, but I feel old when I look at the Doctor and the Companion and the, this ridiculously young and beautiful. It's just <laughs> like, what is going on? The Doctor should be an old man. Like, this is not right. Yeah, we've a we aged up. We sort of did the climb, you know. Oh, David Tennant and oh, Matt Smith, you know, I know they were similar age at start. Uh, and then we're up and again, oh, Capaldi, oh, we're really old. And then we go down back to Jodie Whittaker and then we we'll go down to Shooty. And it's like, <laughs> who's, who's next? Space Baby. Well, baby it, good day. It, it was really interesting because it's like um, uh, Matt Smith was the youngest Doctor Who to date. Uh, 27, I believe it was when he took over the role. Mm -hmm. And I thought they did a really great job, which I can say exactly the same as Sheeti. It's like I do have those moments where I like suddenly look and go, wait a minute, he's younger than me. And it really does anger me, like Jim's saying. But for most of the time, I forget because I yeah. guess, again, Sheeti and uh, and Matt were both really great at playing old. Like you, you always got the feeling they've mm. lived all these lives. And just this, like in Matt's case, that particular incarnation decided to like you know enjoy the kind of like fun madcapness of it like he was kind of like a biggles character in some bits and just very full of life in that way whereas this doctor is just so full of life and love and like that's his kind of like way of being young but when he has a moment where he talks about his past and he talks about susan for instance uh man you feel like you know, there's no question that he was william hartnell you know what i mean it's like he was mm. the first doctor it's very nice like the, the wisdom of age suddenly yeah, 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 and they just such great actors for being able to do that. Um, but yeah, uh, just skipping over a few things which we already talked about. Yeah, so you get the lovely scene where you got uh, the doctor plays his little trick, and I do like that idea. So you've established that the gods you can only use a trick once on them, which is nice because it gives mm. you somewhere to go where you can trick them, but once you've used it, it's spent. That was rather good. In the same scene, the woman who's in the window who ends up playing the piano. She's actually a costume designer from uh, Tom Baker's era, and she's she in class. Ah, I heard about that, yeah. And I'm gonna because we're in there. I'm gonna tell the story again. Like you guys have probably already heard it, maybe even from me. But I love the fact that the way that came about was uh, the producers wanted this big colourful scarf, and they gave her her all the material and goes, "Could you make a scarf for Tom with with these colours?" And she thought she had to use all of it. So that's why it's so ridiculously long. But then she, she they came in, she came in with a go, here you go. And they go, what are we meant to do with this? Tom walks past, goes, brilliant, wraps it around himself 20 times and just goes off and beats the doctor in his particular version. And it's just one of those wonderful little accidents. And that's because of this lady. Um, but yeah, just a lovely yeah. little nice touch in there. Um, and she gets strangled yeah. by a musical scarf. She does indeed. Yeah. <laughs> um Oh, yeah, and the giggle is the bit which gives it away to the Doctor. That was nicely done. I like the way that's mm. how we traced it back. And we established that she is actually the son of the toy maker. Um, yeah, again, I was really... Everything about this, I'm absolutely fine with. I know some people who kind of, like, got this problem with just uh, with this character or kind of, like, uh, training back. But I thought this was a wonderful reveal. I agree, and I think this idea that the toy maker and now Maestro are something beyond what we've seen before does actually 
create a sense of danger for the Doctor because much as the Master's returns always trumpeted and the Daleks and the Cybermen, the Doctor has defeated them so many times that there's no real sense of danger, but this does feel like something new and different and it feels like the rules might not be the same with these people. So, yeah, I'm liking where they could go with this. And with only eight episodes as well, I mean, if we're assuming that this arc will get wrapped up this season, which usually that that's what we've done with Doctor Who, um, you know, since it came back. But, you know, I, I feel like they're not going to be overused, but we're still going to get them regularly enough for them to feel like a threat. And yeah, yeah. I'm liking what they're doing with it so far. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I, I want it to just be a broad church. I love the idea they're bringing these fantasy elements, and you know, with with sci-fi, you can always bring in like, well, they're gods; they don't have to play by our rules. That's great. That's fine. I do still want the sci-fi to be in there. I think, like with uh, uh, Moffat's episode, which is up next, boom. I think we're going to get a bit more of that kind of yeah, style. Exactly. And like, so I'm, 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 I'm all for everything. I just don't want to lose any elements, but. Adding these elements is lovely. And the idea the Sonic actually gets used to disrupt sound was really nice. All these yeah. years, the Sonic screwdriver, they actually use the fact that... With Sonic light. <laughs> yeah. like, we're going to disrupt sound with a light. <laughs> it's like, hmm. Okay, well, Sonic screwdriver now became a torch that can disrupt, disrupt sound. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, Jack, again, I had kind of this, that it was the sound which really did it with the light focusing it. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I, I like the idea. Just the Sonic use the Sonic vibration, which is was a really nice idea. But yeah, I, you're right. I did love the scene of uh, with the uh, tuning fork going yes. into the puddle. And yeah, then everything yeah. and in slow motion, the vibration and that uh, that was brilliant. Yeah, it was great. And, and the, the way and it worked was great. Yeah, uh, and the bit where they go into the future and you see the kind of wasteland that is Earth. Really remind me of Pyramids of Mars. I don't know if anyone else has kind of got that, but there's a scene where the Doctor basically does the exact same thing with Sarah Jane. Yeah. Like the future yeah. where Sutek has uh, ruined the Earth. Lovely kind of callback, which didn't feel so similar. It was intrusive. It's kind of one of those little Easter eggs, it felt like. I don't know if it was on purpose. I'm guessing seeing as RTD said several times, Pyramids of Mars is his favourite episode. It's I'm guessing not it, yeah. a coincidence. Yeah. He featured it in Queer as Folk. Uh, in the background of a scene where two gentlemen were having a very good time. I believe it was on the TV in the background. Of course they were. They were watching Pyramids of Mars. Yeah. yeah. And and having a lovely room. Um, <laughs> uh, so, 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 uh, yeah. Uh, Jinx and Doctor. Jinx kidnaps Ruby. The Doctor finds his sonic end plugged into the thing as i say so yeah then we do get towards that ending one bit which i did get a bit lost at because where you got the scene where ruby plays the piano and she mentions a relation like uh i played this to cheer up my friend uh whatever no debbie we'll say just to pull the name out of the air mm -hmm. because she broke it up with this girl there's a bit where Jinx says, like, I, di I, I didn't know what, I didn't tie those things together, but she goes like, uh, oh, music for heartbroken lesbians, be still my heart. I'm going, that's a really random, like, I'm, why? Like, I, I didn't tie that back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, like, I, yeah, I did, but I can see why if you didn't, <laughs> that would be a bit confusing. Like, yeah. All the representations, but that seemed random to me. <laughs> Sounds like an avant-garde album title. Yeah, it was just a scene apart, and it was enough. It's, a, it's a whole new, whole new genre of country. Yeah, sure, yeah why not? Um, oh, we got the music floating in the air. What do we think? That I think it was all right. I didn't mind, but I thought that got overused. No. I thought it was overused, but I thought the CG wasn't as good as some. Yeah, of the CG had. was not great. It looked the very masking was really bad. Yeah. I mean, I would have had Jinx using it as a kind of like lasso, maybe even having Ruby tied up in it when she's in the sky but that's it. not like yeah. every note that's played when they're having no. the music battle which was really fun as well i like that but just those things floating in the air kind of again sort of felt a bit distracting. It, see the thing we the thing with cgi as well you need a physical prop occasionally to yes. ground it so you know when he's looking through the window and it's wrapped around the two door handles before he smashes his way through the 
uh, recording booth. It's like, yeah. it was CGI on the door handles. But that was the perfect time to just have a 3D printed, flexible version of it just wrapped around a couple of times. It's like, just to ground that little scene. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. Like, and then your brain, if it sees it real once, is more likely to expect it's real again. Yeah. So that's why it's, yeah, it's why Jurassic Park works. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love that... the films. And like I, I think like uh yeah, obviously we talk about Star Trek a lot, and like there was some lovely ones where they've used a composite, whereas now sometimes when they just go to all special effects, it's got so much better, but I miss the models because the models really make sci-fi work very yeah. nicely when it's kind of um, blended. Just the level of detail you get, which even with modern CGI, sometimes I feel like you miss a little bit of the detail which you get with models. Especially on a TV budget. Like, you know, mm. I know there's been oh, all the talk, talk of Disney coming in and, the you know, the BBC threw a lot of money at Doctor Who before Disney got involved. But at the end of the day, it has still not got a budget comparable to Hollywood blockbusters and if you're trying to do so many effect shots every episode there's only so much money to go around and yeah it to me it just looked a bit plasticky and as Jack said it, di it didn't look tangible so you didn't feel the the threat from it but the performances were all good and the story yes. was generally well told so that makes up for a multitude of sins i mean we won't be sitting here talking about doctor who 60 years after it came out if special effects were a deal breaker so <laughs> you know point, point. i mean i think always <laughs> the the show should survive the special effects aging like like i i hate when film like i say i hate it I've seen big blockbusters, which are just good fun in the cinema at the time. They're just all about the loud explosions. They're not meant to be built to last. They're just meant to be a fun sum of blockbusters. Mm. If you're just using a CGI fest on that, fair enough. But my favorite ones, I think, are the ones which, after CGI looks cheesy, there's enough story there to carry it. Yeah. And I think that's why Dog 2 kind of endures. It's never had the budget. It's just always had the kind of good no. stories. Um, but one, one little floor I did have with this. How long do those notes above the piano where they played the right chords stay up there? Because they were just there conveniently long enough for the Beatles to come along, bang out the end of the tune, and then they, they fuck off. But the, the black notes didn't stay in the air. It was just mm. kind of no, the, yeah, the, yeah, it was a bit weird. Good point. I Good weird. point. And, and one thing I would have added here, I'm just going to say, I think where you have got the first black incumbent doctor, I would love to have seen a bit more kind of like, they played a bit of ragtime in there, but there wasn't a, a lot of music for a black origin. I was, I was really wanting some soul sort of mixed in here. And I, yeah. and if you've gone full Beatles, I would have missed it so much because you're concentrating on a particular artist. But they brought in so many musical in influences mm. and, you know, I don't know, it just seemed like a little more missed opportunity to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say one, I'll say one thing yeah. about, um, the uh, I'm trying to think of the framing of the villain. So <laughs> I were on about this uh, in the chat earlier. So Ewan was watching it, and I noticed how much on the maestro they focused on the eyes and the face. Yes, <laughs> Ewan actually said at one point, went, "I just want to. I think they should just pull their eyes out." <laughs> and I just said, "I just said." What? But her eyes, she's the naughty person and they need to pull her eyes out. And I just went, but why? And he says, they're always on the screen. And I, then I sort of watched it a bit more and it's like, it was very eye-centric and focusing on these menacing eyes and all that. And then he said, it was like, nope, you need to get rid of those eyes and it'll defeat her. I'm only getting a little bit worried by how much uh, you and I'm only getting a little bit like, worried. Yeah. yeah. So, he, he loved the first I'm, one. I thought it was I, a good laugh. And the second one is like, pull the eyes out, pull the eyes out. Yeah. And then, I'm impressed. He's going to be a That's film bad. critic. Well, <laughs> yeah, afterwards, he just went, he was watching and he went, Daddy, yeah. is that a man in a dress? And I'm like, oh, I, I now need to have the drag conversation. <laughs> but I was like, yes, and the everybody's gender different. Yeah, yeah. I was like, everybody's different, and whatever makes someone happy, you know, they can do it. They're not hurting anyone. They're enjoying life. And uh, I said, and if you see anyone like that, you know, you just be as nice to them as you are to everyone. I was like, oh, of course I would, Daddy. Like, good, 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 good. 
So, right, now let's continue watching the episode. And it's definitely like, don't pull their eyes out. And, yeah, don't pull their eyes <laughs> yeah. out. No matter how much they stare at you, the eyes stay in. <laughs> No, I just wanted to know I'm a they. Right, I know how to deal with this. It's a, no, it looked like a hate crime. That's not good, you. <laughs> but no, but no, I, thought, I, I, I thought it was actually a great introduction to drag for him because I yeah. So. And, and yeah. RTD has said it's like the more you normalize these things because they are normal, and you put them in an episode, kids will just grow up with it. I'm actually very jealous because like I make mistakes. Like earlier on the episode. I said she then corrected myself today for, for Jinx. Uh, I don't know what Jinx goes by, but this character was they. And I believe usually now the the uh, appropriate thing is for someone to play what, what they are gender-wise. That seems to be what we're kind of going for now, which is cool. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, but I, I, I fem, love the fact that... Femdom non-binary. Oh, fem presenting non-binary, I believe. So Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm going by they because that's what the character is, and I, 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 yeah. I think that's the same. But um, have to be corrected. But I, I do love the fact that it's like because yeah, I say I make mistakes with it, never, never intentionally, and I apologize when I do. But it's like I love the kids are just going to grow up with this just as a fact. I wish I'd grown up with that. I wish I didn't. Like my my monkey brain doesn't overtake some. I hate when that happens. It's so disrespectful. I just I you hope see, everyone I agrees. Felt like everyone when realized we were younger. It was intentional. I felt I felt when we were younger, we saw far more drag than we do now. Yeah, you, it was you just think the birdcage. Yeah, yeah, the birdcage. Um, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Yeah, Jay Madner, Lily Savage. Jay Madner, Lily Savage, Lily Savage on TV every Saturday night doing blankety blank. Yeah, yeah. It's like I felt like we had a lot more exposure to it, and um, mm. Eddie is hard. Oh, God, like, it seems to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's just the, the terminology is the only thing. It's just, again, yeah. Yeah. I, I make mistakes based on what I was taught when I was a child, which I'm trying to evolve from. But I, I if there was something I could delete from my head, it would be making that mistake because I, I don't I like it. I don't like being disrespectful. And I just, again, I like the fact they're just, it's just not going to be a thing for them. And, and everyone should just shut up. Like, it's not like they're going to grow up without being a problem. We need to shut Like our generation needs to shut up. If you like, if you see what I mean, like with, with all this bullshit, like, Oh, but it's difficult for me. No, it's not. We can do it. We can do it. Like we might make mistakes and hopefully people forgive us when we do as, as to my point. But yeah, we can, we can do it. It's all right. <laughs> the kids will correct Aside our from the, 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 like the, the drag side of it and everything, just in terms of Ewan's reaction. So it's Ewan five, Jack, for everybody. Five. Yeah. Listening. Five. It shows that the direction and the framing of the episode and everything and the performance is very effective, that you've got a five-year-old who instantly knew that's the baddie from the way they were shot and the way they were shown on screen. I think that shows yeah. that the, the show is doing its job, that they're getting that across on a, on a visual level. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, oh, and we should just uh, quickly give a shout out that Ruby in this scene, uh, there's another kind of callback to who she is and who she represents because mm -hmm. Jinx is kind of uh, distracted, certainly by the fact that there's something within her head, which just so happens to be some ripe free Christmas music, which was convenient. Um, <laughs> uh, Carol of the Bells or Bell of the Carols or whatever. Yeah, it was, it was one of them, one of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, then we wrap up kind of, yeah, they get tracked in musical instruments they burst out when the beatles play the chords we've already covered that bit and pretty much we're heading towards the end you've got um jinx just before uh they disappear does uh say about the the uh, the they he who waits i believe it is the the one who waits, the, who waits. the one who yeah. waits the one who waits um and uh Jim, you know, something a bit interesting just after this. Which we I did. Before. They go up to the top of the building and they're talking and there's a massive big billboard. I forget the actual name. I think if you've got a screenshot of it. Is it that is the billboard, but my face oh, is covering it. Bollocks, I've been on the so, um, Give me half a sec. I can get it to come to the front. I just so, yeah, they go up and there's this billboard and it's a reference to um, a Christmas song or something. And it's somebody waits, spelt W-A-I-T-E-S. And, you know, obviously this visual is not an accident. Somebody's designed this. 
And this reminds me of Russell T. Davis's penchant, shall we say, for dropping things into episodes. Like we had Bad Wolf and then we had Torchwood. Uh, I forget what the one in... Oh, Mr. Saxon was the, the third series one. So I'm wondering if there's going to be a weights reference hidden somewhere in in each of the episodes. And I've not had a chance to go back, back and watch all of Space Babies yet. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if maybe on a crew manifest or on a name tag or so or on a display screen, if there's something about weights hidden I somewhere. I couldn't find so it. I did look. My, my theory is that that's going to be the... It's not just going to be the the one who waits. There's there's going to be something else planted in there and that maybe the one who waits will be Chris Waits. That's <laughs> it. Chris Ra- Waits and the Carolers. Um, and that's very prominent taking up a huge amount of the screen there so i feel like we were meant to notice that and i feel like it's it like too it. much of a coincidence yeah. that it it's the scene immediately following when um maestro said that so i don't know what it's leading to i don't have a theory on who the one who waits is going to be but i wanted to put that out there so when there's all these articles like have you noticed all the weights clues there you go. Gallifrey stands noticed it week one. I mean, I, I, I didn't notice it, I will say. I'm not trying to claim I did, but now you've mentioned it, it seems obvious I should point out. I don't want to make it. It's like, yeah, yeah, I saw that. No, Jim totally told me that. But I, when I was watching Space Babies back earlier today, I was looking out for it. I was making some notes. I might have missed it, but I didn't see a weights in there. So maybe it's not in every episode, but it's like that. It might it not be. be. Uh, it would be so, it might... maybe it's red herring. But... It might be something more subtle, like the one that they did with the fourth series where it was like there was references to planets disappearing or to the bees or so but it wasn't the so, exact same thing every episode i knew it rang a bell when you said about chris waits and the carolers mm. i i used the, the miracle of google in ta, in tardis tardis wiki mm. Chris Waits and the Carolers are a fictional band referenced in the show's first ever episode, An Unearthly Child, really? on the 23rd of November, 1963. Oh, nice. Susan uh, b- 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 is listening to the music on her transistor radio. She's caught listening to it on the transistor radio by the uh, two teachers and later travellers. Nice. Because yeah. as I also so it's, mentioned, it's a, it's, now. A deep, it's a deep cut throwback, including they've just spoke about Susan. Now, it, this is right. My theory yeah, is starting yeah, I, to form I think now. Susan and Chris that if more. if it is if Susan is the one who waits, maybe we're going to get not necessarily somebody waits in each episode, but maybe we're going to get something that's a call back to Susan in yeah. some way. So maybe there's something in Space Babies that'll link to something else that Susan did. Oh, well, that um, maybe like that's the Doctor's granddaughter. I mean, it's a bit of a yeah. But I think it'll be something a bit more subtle then. But yeah, it, I mean, if if all it is is a callback to that reference in the very first episode, then that's great. That's fine. That works. But. I don't know. The Wait. timing is there. Oh uh, yeah, I, I think yeah. I think that's excellent to bring something from the like if they brought something from the first ever episode and made it something so pivotal, uh like if they do make it then something pivotal, I think that's just genius. That's just lovely work. And yeah, the uh story which I briefly mentioned earlier, yeah, when they uh in when the first series, probably the first series, uh Susan puts on the Beatles on the view screen and the doctor and Susan and uh, Barbara and Ian watched them for a minute. Mm. Doctor, of course, poo poos it and then they move on with the episode. Originally, the Beatles were apparently up for guest appearing. They all liked the idea, but their management decided it was too lowbrow for them. So of uh, this is a sort of like callback to that. Um, that's I, th- I, I think that was somewhere in the thinking with RTD when he, he was doing this episode. So it's kind of nice. It's like they may have been 60 years too late. And they may have been on the screen for two seconds, but they got there in the end. They're there, we got them in there in the end. Yeah. yeah. Um, the only other thing which I've got 
here is yeah just the twist at the end bit now again as i say it was what really annoyed me a little bit was it's like again it's it's actually a nice song it was near where it was in my head for days like um but rtd did an interview where he goes like oh yeah but if you're gonna finish your song you have to earn it you have to have it like baked into it, it has to make sense where it is it's like it couldn't have been more tacked on no, it didn't. And it it was just, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. There was no reason for them to burst yeah. in the song, but I didn't object to it just because it no, was no. a bit of fun. Yeah, but the I, only I only thing think... that tied it back to Maestro was Harbinger coming out mm. of the door at one point. Yes, yeah, it's they, like they Henry Harbinger. H R H. What were you? Yeah, Henry Arbinger. Henry Arbinger. Yeah, or something Harbinger. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Is, are we going to see him again? Is he going to be the harbinger just for Maestro, or is he going to be the harbinger for each of the Ooh. gods or whatever we're going to call or them? Is he going to then in the next episode we're going to see him grown up because you know Timey Wimey and all that, so Maybe. he could be the the third iteration. So actually, so that's the toy maker's grandson as well, the Doctor's granddaughter. Mm. If we're going to look for parallels, oh there? maybe, yeah. Can I, that, some of that I just remember as well when it first came out about Jinx being cast. Do you guys remember when they revealed literally at the start that oh well we've got Neil Patrick Harris as the toy maker mm. and Jinx is playing the music maker? Oh yeah, before they named a maestro, like and it went all oh, right. So they spoiled the fact right at the start. It's like well, toy maker, music maker, they're both going to be gods, and they revealed that like nine, ten months ago. Oh, well, mm. also you've got the um, music maestro, which is a Batman villain, was played by Neil Patrick. I saw this earlier today. Was played by Neil mm. Patrick Harris in the animated series of Batman. Oh, there mm. we go, then. Wrap it all in so crossover. Over. Crossover. Uh, yeah, we're going to cross over Star Trek, so, Batman, Doctor Who. It's going to be quite the episode. So uh, what? What next? Then, if we have the toy maker and the music. Mate, well, well, you know, maestro, but the music maker. So, what, what's next? We've had games, the enemy. music, the enemy, games, music. The enemy. I don't Video. know. We'll find out. Um, Video. That'd be oh, interesting. You... Yeah. I would the also add to it. Games maker. Oh, filmmaker. Oh yeah, no. I was thinking computer games. Exactly. Yeah. Games is toy. Yeah. Isn't it? I was thinking. Yeah. Computer, you're right. It isn't different enough. Filmmaker's better. Um, I also thought the song just felt a little bit. It felt faux sixties. It didn't feel like a sixties number to me. Like whereas No, you know, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted it to really be a sixties sort of like and when I saw the doctor in the uh, clip when we see him kind of like shake away behind the microphone, I didn't sound like it was shooty to me, like the voice. I don't think no. it was. I was really looking forward to him oh. doing a big number. I wanted Austin Powers, the start of Austin Powers when he's doing the dance through the world. Yeah. Like, yeah, um, like, you want that type of music. There was yeah, also a bit where there was a bit of music and the doctor said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought that was non-diegetic. And so that's again breaking the fourth wall. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know whether that was just a throwaway joke um, or not. And for anyone listening, apologies. It, it, so diegetic music is music that the characters can hear within the scene. So if there's a record playing, that's diegetic. Non-diegetic is usually the score or what have you. Well, I thought we... he was saying that the noise of like wind through the trees and stuff, which stuff which is naturally happening, is diegetic. I didn't think he meant the stuff inside the studio. Well, no, because I I, I didn't took know it, I took it as like a meta commentary that the doctor's saying, "Oh, I thought that sound was." not real you know i thought that was put in in post whereas the line which precedes it, to you. the lights which precedes it she's saying it's like well but music's always existed because you get naturally caring sounds which are musical like the wind through the street mm. so she does say that and then he goes that's non-diegetic i i didn't know the phrase before so i just assume it meant nature sound or na natural music no it, it it specifically relates to to film and whether a sound is real within the frame of the film meaning. or whether it's... Diaget. Hmm. I'm just wondering if film got it from... A, unless, a it, unless there's two meanings to it, but I, I took that as the Doctor breaking the fourth wall <laughs> again and comment, commenting on 
which makes me wonder how meta this is all going to go this season. Oh, here we go. Origin 1970. I mean, it's got the meaning exactly as you've said, of course. And it's got origins 1970s in the sense of in the writer's own voice. So maybe he's using a metaphor for nature sounds. Because oh, it, again, maybe, just uh, in the context of the scene, but it doesn't sound like it fits the word. But he's, yeah. we've had a, a games maker, we, you know, a toy maker, we've had a music maker. Are we going to have a storyteller at some point? And yes. could, the story, could the yeah, actual story which, maker who builds yeah. And it's yeah. that a way of acknowledging Doctor Who as a fiction because you can get away with it with that if you have a god who's saying, Right, your life is now a story and then it can still be real with you know, Supernatural did it quite well and um you know there's, there's been various examples but uh, quite a few of them it'd be a spoiler to talk about, but um yeah. See we learned some back up to no, I'm just going to say we learned some today. See, you, you yeah. get you get two episodes of Doctor yeah. You talk about you learn something. Come on, Gallifrey stands. All I'm saying. Sorry, Jack. This might have explained something I've always had a question about. Funnily enough, on another subject we all share, in Strange New Worlds with the musical episode. Uh huh. When when the first song starts and Artagus is walking on the bridge, and someone, where is that music? And she says, nowhere from on the ship. And it's like. Is she actually meta pointing out that it's yeah. non diagnostic It didn't make sense. Yeah. Nowhere, nowhere be, on the yeah. ship. It's like, well, how do you know yeah. there's nowhere on the ship? Surely the speakers in the 24th century sound, 23rd century sound amazing in the room. It's like that you can't mm -hmm. just pinpoint it. Oh, it's coming out of that PA system up there. Uh, but she's genetically, is a number one because she's genetically engineered, we find out. Like, no, um, Artegas. Or no, no, she's a human energy thing. Ortegas flies the ship. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Ortegas, like, yeah, she's got no reason to. I was just trying to think of a, a flange from what we find out later. But no, <laughs> well, I may no, have no, to no, go no, watch Strange New Worlds ship. again now so I can think about that. Um, it's just, I just she like, walks onto the bridge, it plays, she just goes, yeah, the music come from? Nowhere, nowhere, on the ship. nowhere on the ship. Could be. Uh, just, just to round it up, um, yeah, speaking of diegetic uh, uh non-diegetic music which i can now speak about because uh, jim has educated me to what it means uh i do love the fact that the um the sound which the tardis relates to and they they mix in the theme tune a few times and that's what the the tardis responds to because why not because rtd's done it with yeah. the uh, sound of drums oh. as well is the four bars from the doctor theme tune I, uh, I, I thought that was nice again though if we are going somewhere quite meta with all of this that plays into that having the doctor who theme tune exist yeah with it in mind though if you go back to remembrance of the daleks ace is watching telly and doctor who is about to come on when she turns the uh, telly off so you know we've done this uh, before but... did, 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 well you know what they actually say is like and now for a brand new science fiction tv show yeah, doc, doc, and then switch yes off. exactly nicely oh, done so it's suggested but and it would be exactly when it was going out which was very nice mm -hmm. yes I, I might know the scene you mean not that i'm nerdy about it or anything <laughs> not that we're Gents. all nerdy about all this sort of stuff <laughs> but you're allowed <laughs> yeah. to be nerdy so before we wrap up um final thoughts i mean i just thought two banging episodes i really enjoyed it really nice way of starting the series i would have just flipped around a bit but that's about it um yeah i thought these were nice nice openers to the series guys yeah, enjoyed the second one a lot more. Yeah. Um, first one was just a bit of fluff. And like you say, I would have preferred that to come after something a bit more substantial. Um, but I, I enjoyed them. On first viewing, I enjoyed them more than I think I enjoyed any of the Chibnall run. And that that's not, again, just having a... A random go at it for no reason. I'm not not just being snarky. Uh, that that's genuinely how I how I felt about it. Yeah, I was just thinking back compared to other companions' first outings as well as Doctor's first outings. Mm. So when you think about Eccleston and Rose in the Artons in her um, shop that she works in, oh, yeah, yeah. they're actually quite a weak episode. You know, the man eating bins, I was not a fan of. Yeah, and it yeah. hurts. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's when you, start, yeah, you yeah. start going back and you go, yeah, the first episodes aren't always that great. It's like, <laughs> well, I think the reason why that one fares better than the episode probably is in the writing, as you say. I think the reason why it gets away with it is because you are re the doctor, so that's such our main focus. You 
don't sort of notice how ropey the kind of storyline is. And we've got the Orton's back. It should be really mm. exciting, but it's sort of like, yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah, mean, there's... You know. yeah. It's like, so overall, when you look at these and you go, you know what? Space Babies wasn't the worst. No. Oh, not by into far. The series. Uh, and that, that was one of my favorites and that really isn't the biggest episode but it's just so like it feels like it never stops it feels like very mm -hmm. angry and you establish yeah. the mad energy of matt smith he doesn't really need a big episode to just be explained no, that's a story. great episode i always uh, felt like, like he was the, the sort of adhd doctor basically <laughs> you know? and you've kind of got i i've oh sorry go sorry no, yeah, no, I was no. just going to say, because like, uh, I felt like he was sort of like the ADHD doctor, and then you had uh, Capaldi, who felt a bit of an allegory for autism in the way he kind of processes yeah. things. I thought it was mm. really interesting. Um, and now we just got Shooty as just a big puddle of love. Just scraping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love and energy. And, and I really regret the phrase puddle of love. Don't overthink it, guys. But he's just a big ball of energy, and he's lovely, and he's very loving. And I like that. Indeed. But yeah. <laughs> So the only, thing uh, I'd, only thing I'd ever drop is the musical number at the end without art give a reason for it. I, I would just yeah blend it in more. I would had I, I would find a way of including Jinx Monsoon and the Beatles more in it. Like yeah, in, in, in that uh, song would have been going. You through. have Jinx as they're being dragged into the piano casts a final spell that makes them all sing a song. You know that. Yeah, even that would have ways of doing it. Pulled it in a bit more, but yeah. Mm. Anyway, yeah, very yeah. fun episode, very fun song, but yeah, just maybe uh, uh, not the best earned in that bit. But thank you very much, gents. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I'm sure I can have you guys back on another time if you'd be up for it. Yeah, yeah no absolutely. Problem. Jim, I believe we've got another uh, podcast we might do on a uh, Wednesday at six o'clock. We do indeed. Wednesday, six o'clock, Retrek podcast. Uh, yeah, you can find us on Facebook. Um, yeah all the socials whatnot so check us out there we by the time you watch this we will have just done one oh yeah the previous day about the latest episode of discovery so check that Which out you can still get now like you can watch it back none stop yeah oh, absolutely yeah you can do let's fly and do you that right. now uh, just a little bit of uh discovery humor for you there uh jack uh please uh give a hearty plug for the high council of geeks so, pray tell what is this high council of geeks which we're all a member of so i'll just pretend i don't know well of course Squee. um the high council of geeks is a online group of uh, like-minded individuals we tend to meet up go to events um we host our own event in collaboration with madam misfit geek days and nerd nights we tend to do the geek day. She does the nerd nights. Oh, yeah. And um, we're just, as I said, like minded guys supporting each other, enjoying film evenings, book clubs, everything. So if you search us on Facebook, I Council of Geeks, come and join us. I'd also chuck in just in Nerd Night, we also have, of course, the amazing Adam Washington, who does uh, oh, a sharing and quizzing of the night, uh, which is always a good time. Uh, but thank yes. you very much, gents. It's been a great way of kicking off a new series of Doctor Who, the new season, season one of Doctor Who. We're back at the start again, and, and I'm having a good time. Uh, so from me, Jack and Jim, until next week, live life, you've got two hearts, and please be kind. <laughs>